Hi there, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors at Marco Presbyterian Church, and I am really glad that you have found us online. If there is anything that we can do for you here at Marco, would you please let us know, because our mission is to bring hope to people with the truth of Jesus. One way we're doing that is a brand new fresh sermon series for 2023 about Jesus the man and what it's like to be in his kingdom. So I'm just hoping one day I'll get to meet you. God's blessing. Good morning, everybody. My name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'd love to have you open your Bibles, your devices, whatever you've got, to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. You know, Scott referred to the readable Bible. I don't know if Rod and Becky are here this morning. No, they went back to Kansas. Rod and Becky, as Scott said, gave 14 years of their lives to translate the entire Bible, the readable Bible. And I recommend you look at it. You can look at it at Gospel Challenge Foundation. If you go to that website, I've just ordered 100 copies of the Gospel of John we want to give out in the community we're living in now. And uh, you may want to have a look at that. It's, it's uh, a, a wonderful thing to give to uh, anybody, your kids and your grandkids and whoever you think could use God's Word. So all I want to do for the next 27 and a half minutes is tell you about Jesus. Across the street from where Beth and I are living, we've got this thing called the Swamp Buggy Races. Swamp Buggy Races. We had to go by there yesterday because I got to look at that stuff. I mean, there was a lot of action. There was a lot of action at the Swamp Buggy place. And uh, if there are pockets of places where people aren't seated this morning, it's because they're over there, I suppose. But my point is that the, I saw action there. What you're going to find when I read this passage of Scripture to you is Jesus in action. Jesus in action. So please stand with me, and I'm going to read God's holy word to you. Gospel of John, fourth chapter, and I want to pick up the episode at verse 23. This is the Word of God. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee. Could have been up to 204 different cities and towns in that region. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So Jesus' fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed Jesus from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. You may be seated. One of the interesting things about watching children grow up, watching children grow up, is to see how often children imitate their parents. As you observe a child's mannerism, their tone of voice, their facial expression, their behavior, you often see something of their mother or their father or a little bit of both and even a grandparent. For example, without being conscious of it, I hold a spoon exactly in the way in which my dad did. And when we would talk on the phone or people would phone us, we sounded identical. I tell you this because Jesus wants 
you and me to imitate him, to imitate Jesus' values, his speech, his thoughts, his actions. In fact, it's so strong that in 1 Thessalonians 1.6, 1 Thessalonians 1.6, we are told that when we imitate Jesus, it is evidence of the fruit of true faith in us. Now, if we're going to imitate Jesus, or as 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 says in the original, mimic him, mimic him. If we're going to imitate Jesus, we've got to ask some questions. We've got to ask, who is this man, Jesus? We've got to ask, what is he like? We, we've got to ask, how does he act? And so in one simple sentence, we get a striking summary of what Jesus did. Look again at verse 23. He went throughout all of Galilee, one, teaching in their synagogues, two, proclaiming the gospel, and three, healing everybody that he came into contact with. We can boil it down this way. When Jesus was here, he touched the world in three ways, his thoughts, his words, and his deeds. Or we can say it this way, his thinking, his speaking, and his actions, what he thought what he said, and what he did. So my point this morning for you is simple. What Jesus thought were to think. What Jesus said were to say. What Jesus did we are to do. Now we could, we could diagram it with a triangle. Thoughts, words, and deeds. That's a composite picture of the Lord Jesus and what he wants to see in you and in me. Thoughts, words, and deeds gives us something of the complete person that God has made us as we are image bearers. We're to imitate Jesus in thought, in word, and in deed. Mimic him in our thinking, our speaking, and our acting. Now, one of the questions we love to ask at Marco, and this has been a strength that Scott has brought to us, among others, but we always want to stop and ask the question, why? Why ought you to imitate Jesus? Why, why should I imitate Jesus? Well, I'm going to give a, the short answer, and I'm going to come back to it later, but the short answer is this. The reason that you and I are to imitate Jesus is because of the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. More on that later, but I've got to drill down a little further first. To say all of this in a different way, the Bible refers to people who had a heart after God, a heart that reflected God's heart. And so I'm already going to be asking you this question. Does your heart reflect the heart of Jesus? Jesus' heart was consumed with thinking the thoughts that God had. His life was consumed with speaking words of life and of doing actions that brought life and light and hope to people like you and me. I'm going to ask you again, is your heart like his heart? How about our church? We love our church. Is the heart of Marco Church reflecting the heart of Jesus? What about the church all around the world, church with a capital C, believers all over the globe? Are we together reflecting the heart of Jesus? Now, as I preface this morning, what we see in our text is Jesus in, in action. Jesus is no stuffy, bookish, boring figure from past history. Not at all. Jesus is the most wonderful, exciting, action-oriented person to ever walk on earth. I mean, look at how people responded to him. Verse 24, his fame spread throughout that whole area. And so in just three sentences, you get a precise summary of Jesus in action. Matthew has said it well. 
John wrote one of the Gospels, too. He was an eyewitness of Jesus. So we trust him. And this is what he said, John 21, 25, the last verse of John's fourth Gospel. John writes, Now there are also many other things Jesus did. Were any were every one of them to be written. Now watch this. I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. It's marvelous to think about what Jesus achieved in, in simply three years. So let's break this down. First of all, verse 23, we see Jesus teaching. Now, there are teachers here. There are people who've taught in school and currently teaching in schools. Maybe you taught in whatever work capacity you had. What's required of you to teach? Well, I, I would hope that you spent some time thinking before you taught. You're hoping this morning that I spent a little time thinking before I got behind the pulpit. To teach requires thinking. Jesus, verse 23, is now teaching, which means he had perfect thinking. Colossians 2, 3 says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I mean, imagine what his mind would have been like. Have you ever had the privilege of being around somebody who was like super intelligent? You could sometimes tell. You get around and they're just amazing. Amazing brains that some people have. But imagine Jesus. His mind was perfect. No flaws, no deception, no short-sighted ideas in the mind of Jesus. But we not only see him thinking and teaching, we see him, secondly, proclaiming, verse 23, proclaiming the gospel. He thought, and he taught, and he spoke in the synagogues. But what I love about Matthew's account is he didn't stay huddled in the synagogue any more than you and I should stay huddled in this beautiful place. He went out, and you're going to see that as Scott unfolds chapter 5 for us. But you see, he went out to where the people were, and he spoke, and his words were totally true and totally wise and always good, and they still are. But not only do we see Jesus thinking and teaching and proclaiming, we see him in verse 23, healing. His thoughts were perfect, his words were true, and his actions now exhibited something of his power and his love. I was thinking about it. What's, what's it take 10, 10 years to become a doctor? 14 or something to become a surgeon? And Jesus just walked into town and healed people. <laughs> healed people. Healed them perfectly. He loved people, and he wanted to help them. No wonder, verse 25, great crowds followed him around that entire district. Now, what you and I must catch here is that Jesus is not some average teacher and worker. We are witnessing Jesus' preeminence in all things. What does it mean that Jesus is preeminent? It means Jesus is supreme. It means Jesus is excellent. It means Jesus is first. I mean, Gene hit it for us today. No rival. It's just Jesus, top of the pile. One a current Bible teacher who many of us like to follow put it this way, people are starving for the greatness of God. You see it in their faces. I see it when I'm with people on Marco and Naples. They're starving for something of the greatness of God. And we get it this way. We get it in Jesus. You see, his preeminence means not only that he is supreme and he's excellent and he's first, it means he's superior in all things. We're seeing his preeminence in thought and in word and in deed. We're seeing it in his thinking. You see, what happens to me is when Scott asked me to do this passage, and I'm, I'm living in these, this passage I all of a sudden felt like I got some traction. You know what it's like when you're, you're doing life and, okay, I got my footing. I just got my footing. I got my traction now. You see, it's our pattern. Marco, Jesus has just given you his marching orders. Thought, word, and deed. Triangle. Thought, word, 
and deed because we're getting to observe Jesus in action. So let me just sum it up to make sure I got all of you on the bus. Here we go. We're to imitate Jesus in thought, word, and deed. We're to be people who are after Jesus' own heart so that when people look at you, when people look at me, they see and they hear both, according to this passage, they see and they hear Jesus. But here's my concern. Have you ever wondered what kind of things you project to others? You see, when I'm around people, what do I project? In some sense, it's embarrassing as I look back and think about some of the things I have probably projected to people. There's a sense of shame sometimes, isn't there? When you think, I had opportunities in life. What did I project? When I'm around people, do I project my selfishness, my political bent, my pride, my impatience, my short-sightedness, cultural values? Do I project those things to such a degree that the last thing people see or hear is the preeminence of Jesus? You see, if Jesus was preeminent in my thinking and in my words and in my actions, people would see Jesus. One of the most humbling verses in all the Bible comes to us from the book of Acts. Luke wrote the gospel, and he wrote Acts, Acts 4.13. This comes from people who didn't know Jesus as they were watching particularly Peter and John. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Now watch this. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. That's what they were projecting. I want to give you a quote from Times 1st and 2nd century when the church was being decimated by the Roman Empire. I know there are some of you, and you like to come and tell me that things are worse than they have ever been, and you sometimes look at that expression I give you where you can tell, I don't think Steve totally agrees with me. So I want to bring you back to what it was really like back then. You see, I know things are bad. I'm, I, I watch the news. But think back to the first and second century when Christians were being fed to the lions, when Christians were imprisoned and crucified, and Christians were being used for street lighting. Despite the power and the brutality of the Roman Empire, Caesar Hadrian, who was ruling at the time, was stumped as to why he could not crush those Christians. Well, they've never been able to crush us yet, have they? But Caesar Hadrian wanted to know why. Why is it that I can't wipe these people out? So he sent this guy a guy I wish I could meet, a guy named Aristides. I mean, isn't that a great name, Aristides? Aristides was an early philosopher, Christian philosopher, who set the pace, set us on the right train track for defending the Christian faith. He's the guy who said, we know God exists because the world exists. Great way to get started, isn't it? Now, that has nothing to do with the sermon, and I won't invoice you for that part. But I think it's important to know this guy was a real thinker, and he was helpful. Now, Caesar Hadrian sent this guy, Aristides, to infiltrate the church and come back with answers. What is going on with these Christians that I can't wipe them out? So Aristides did what he was told, he took time to observe these Christians, and this is what he wrote, and we still have exactly what Aristides wrote, which I, which I like from a historic standpoint, that I'm not kind of making this up this morning. It comes from history. This is what they wrote. They love one another, and he who has gives to him who has not, without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their own homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. 
And if there is any among them that are poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. Such, O king, is their manner of life. Now watch this. And verily, this is a new people, and there is something, what? Divine in the midst of them. You see, Jesus was preeminent to the Christians in the first century, and it showed It showed in their thoughts, and it it showed in their words, and it showed in their actions. But what about us? What about you? What about our church or your church up north? One of the British writers that I appreciate, a guy named Michael Green, guy's only written about 50-plus books, but he spent time not only studying the Scriptures deeply, but looking at the church around the world. And it's helpful to have those British eyes. They often see better than we do from our vantage point here. And you're not going to like this, so you can turn your hearing aid down for a moment if you'd like to. This is what he wrote. Disobedience, disobedience is one of the main characteristics of modern Christianity. I'll just let you take that in. As you may know, Marco Church has three pastors. We've got Gary, our pastor of discipleship. We've got Scott, who's our good leader. And then you've got me. Now, I'm the oldest of the three. And and here's what it means that I'm the oldest of these guys. It means I wear the most boring socks of the three of us. I mean, have you ever looked at their socks? Sometimes Gary doesn't even wear socks. I don't know how you do that. You see, I just never learned the art of colorful, interesting, bold, wild socks like these two guys have. Now, just because I'm older doesn't mean I won't or can't learn from these guys. I mean, I like them. So I'm going to attempt to imitate them. So be watching. Today, just boring black, okay? Because you see... I don't even know where you buy these kind of socks, and I don't know what works and doesn't work, because for decades, the top drawer of my bureau, you can come over and look at it, over here, it's just perfectly lined up with black. In the middle, I got the beige and the brown, and over on the right-hand side, I got the navy blue. It's been that way for so long, I don't even think about it. I just grab one, and off I go. So it's going to take me a while to learn to imitate these guys. And so I'm asking you, will you hear the call of Jesus to imitate him in thoughts, in words, and in deeds? So now let me begin to apply this. And don't you like the beautiful picture Gene made for us? Thank you, Gene. There's the heart of Jesus, dead center, because he is preeminent. And we see his thinking and his words and deeds, and he wants that to be true of you and to me. So let's begin with the mind, the thoughts. Your mind takes in information. That's the way God designed it. And your mind processes information. It's busy right now. Some of you are trying to decide what is going to be for lunch today. But that's what's going on. And and your mind is influencing your desires and triggers your will. So therefore, we need to do with our minds, what Paul tells us to do in 2 Corinthians 10.5, where he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and watch this, take every thought captive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Have you in any way become mentally lazy? Our culture says, entertain me, entertain me entertain me. And as a result, we have allowed our minds to slip. But I'm wondering, would you be willing to make a commitment to strengthen your mind, to think God's thoughts after Him? I was saying to somebody that I met for the first time yesterday out here in the parking lot, we were talking about all kinds of things about the role of Christians around the world. And we agreed that Christians should be the best thinkers 
in every area of our culture. Christians should be the best thinkers in every area of our culture. Next, we need to consider our words. It's estimated that the average person speaks 7,000 words per day. I don't know. I, I decided to believe the web since most of the websites said that. I would prefer not to talk about whether men or women speak more because there are some men who talk a lot, I think, so we're not going to pick on any gender. The point is that while it's wonderful that God created our minds and gave us speech, these tongues of ours need some taming. And James is very clear about that. The book of James, chapter 3. James 3, 7, For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. So I've read that for years and thought, well, too bad. I can't tame my tongue, so just let her run. Well, I've wrestled with that because I thought, why would James say that? He doesn't give me any hope. But it was my friend Augustine from the 4th century who clarified it for me. And Augustine said, no, all James says is no person can tame their own tongue. So who could tame your tongue? Who could tame my tongue? Jesus. Jesus, Spirit, if you are a person who has a tame tongue, well, you thank God that your tongue got tamed. That's a hard sentence to say. <laughs> Jesus had a tongue that was tamed. Jesus' words were all about the good news of the kingdom, the gospel. I'm thankful that I've got a friend here from where Beth and I live at Discovery Village, and we took time the other day at the village to celebrate what happens, happened this January. This January marked 250 years since John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace. 250 years, and Jesus was speaking about amazing grace right here, and that's what came from his lips. The amazing grace is Scott was teaching our children that God sent his son for you because you can't save yourself. But Jesus can save you, and he's making that offer with words. So would you ask God's Spirit to make you a person who speaks words of life and hope to others. We begin with the mind, we consider our words, and lastly, to imitate Jesus, we need to examine our actions. It was good old John Calvin who said we must make the invisible kingdom of God visible in our midst. That, that nails it. The invisible kingdom of God ought to be visible on Marco Island because of you, me. You see, what, what struck me about this passage is I drilled down into it myself. Verse 24 tells us they brought people to Jesus. Okay, I, I get that. Word got around. He's the guy you need to see. And they brought people to him. But verse 25 breaks the pattern. Because verse 25 says great crowds followed him all over the area even beyond the Jordan. So in other words, Jesus didn't just sit in the lazy boy and say, if you want help, come on over and I'll see what I can do. He did that. He sat there and people came to him, but he went out to them. We can't stay in these four walls. I mean, I love this place. It is one of the most beautiful campuses I've ever seen. And yet, if we huddle in here, Marco Island's never going to know. And that's why we go out just like he went out. And you see, that's what Luke tells us, as Luke sums things up. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Mighty in deed and word. Feb 10, 11, 12, coming up soon. We're going to have our winter mission celebration. Now, why would we ask you, ladies, to come out for lunch on the 10th, all of you to come out for barbecue on the night of the 10th, men to come for breakfast on Saturday morning, and then come out on Sunday for a mission celebration? Well, we're a global church. We're seeking to be obedient to Jesus and to get the word all around the world. But this time, we're going to focus on Marco and Naples 
and what God is doing right here. We want you to be there for that. Why? Why would you get out of your lazy boy and come over here? Well, because Jesus is preeminent. And you want to be part of what he's doing around the world. Beth and I have a new friend over where we live. This guy goes around and collects extra food. And he was telling me the other day, he drove to the Publix parking lot where we live. There was a Ukrainian family in their van, mom and dad and seven kids. No food. We have a missionary, a mission to the world missionary in Ukraine. And here we are, what, at the one, one year anniversary of this war. And they've started what they're calling their winter initiative, crates for Ukraine. You can get on Amazon or Walmart and get one of these cool-looking crates, and they'll tell you exactly what to put in there, bandages in the works, and ship them over to Ukraine. And then this missionary will make sure they're hand-delivered to people in their church who've stayed in Ukraine, some in Poland, and then also to take them to people they're trying to minister to. I was so excited when a couple stopped me at that door back there said, give me the website, I'm doing it. I thought, that's great. If you're looking for something to do, and I know it's traffic's busy, but get in your car and drive down Golden Gate. The corner of Golden Gate and 68th, Beth and I were just up there to check it out. Our Haitian church that we support here just got into a fabulous building. I mean, it is just, to me, beautiful. Seats 467 people in that place. And that pastor and his, his leaders are marvelous. They're imitating Jesus in thought, word, and in deed. And they need our help. They need our help to get permitted and into that place. But what a great ministry. I'll close with this. I've had a lot of privileges in life. But one of the great privileges I had was where I went to college. Not only did I get to meet my bride, but as I went up the hill, Lookout Mountain, the motto of the college I went to is this, in all things, Christ preeminent. I mean, what a way to run a college. In all things, Christ preeminent. Jesus is preeminent in science, in philosophy, in the arts, music, medicine. He is preeminent in business, education, parenting, marriage, sports, retirement, money, politics. And the day is coming when Jesus will be acknowledged by every human being as being preeminent. He will have no rivals, he will have no competition, no pockets of resistance, no pockets of rebellion. I'm asking you this morning, will you bring your life into submission to Jesus and imitate him in your thinking, in your words, and in your actions? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming here so that incredible truths and concepts got worked out in you as you were Jesus, the man. And we get to see what your thinking was like and what your words were like and what you did while you were here. And then you've sent us out to do the same. Please forgive us when we've been unfaithful to this calling. Thank you for those pockets of obedience that we do see. Continue to stir us to be people who imitate you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.